Anyway, Eve and her family, for the next 20 minutes, came up so close to my boat that I was constantly switching the engine into neutral because I didn't want to hit them. And uh, after a few minutes, I could just barely see something. And oh, it was an island. And I popped out, and I was into the glorious sunset and in the clear. And I kept waiting for Eve's family to come out of the fog, but they never did. And that was, for me, it was like, worlds colliding, trying to figure out what had gone on, that she had turned around, that she'd stayed by my boat, and then when the, I was safe, she turned around again. And at that moment, I believed all the stories about dolphins pushing sailors to shore. I don't know what it is about these whales, but they, they do things like that, and everyone studying these whales sees the same thing. They are our counterparts in the sea, the most complex marine species on the planet. Orca, the ruler of the ocean. Male orcas can be nine tons, 32 feet long, with a towering dorsal fin six feet tall. But crowned with a smaller curved fin, it may be the females that rule the pod. They are the most widely distributed marine mammal in the world. Their realm extends from the Arctic to the Antarctic. Largest of the dolphins, orcas, also called killer whales, number fewer than a hundred thousand worldwide. And finding them will take Jean-Michel Cousteau and his team across the globe, accompanied at times by his son Fabian and daughter Celine. The Cousteau team will journey to both the northern and southern hemispheres as they seek out killer whales in the Pacific Ocean. The team will discover that people and orcas share surprising similarities, even similar needs, a fact made clear by their experiences with Keiko, the world's most famous killer whale. The team will also learn how some of the characteristics we consider strictly human, like language and culture, may have also evolved among killer whales. They'll travel among groups of orcas that are as similar and as different as we are from each other. Their journey begins in the Pacific Northwest, where orcas have been revered by native people for millennia, studied by scientists for decades, and where our story of the complicated relationship between orcas and people begins. What we're trying to do is to make the connection between humans and nature comparing humans and orcas. They are the dominant species in the ocean. We are the dominant species on land. And we all depend on the same thing. The killer whale, the orcas, is such a powerful animal in terms of its appeal to people. It, it, it captivates uh, the imagination because we know that they're large dolphins and they're very intelligent. They live in very social groups, much like our own. John Ford is a pioneer in orca acoustics, the first scientist to identify dialects in their calls and to change our beliefs. Even um, though I've only been involved studying orcas for around 30 years, things have changed so drastically in our attitude towards this incredible animal. The attitude at that time was that these were dangerous uh, animals, uh, a threat to people, a threat to the livelihood of fishermen. And I was caught up in that. When I was young, growing up on Vancouver Island here, we'd go out fishing and a group of orcas would go by and we would be terrified if they swam under the boat because that was the feeling that these were dangerous animals. On our coast in the mid-1960s to mid-1970s, there was a live capture fishery for uh, orcas and they were sent to aquariums all over the world. I actually got a job at the Vancouver Aquarium and soon became a whale trainer in the early 70s and got to know them in that context and, and they were fascinating animals of course. Uh, even then it was quite controversial holding them in captivity but I, I realized we had so much to learn from them. Orcas have very large, complex brains, and when I first caught sight of an orca brain, which was in a jar on a shelf in a lab, I was really quite amazed. So the first question that came to me was, what does this whale do with that brain? It's 
still the question I'm asking. <laughs> <laughs> and that was 40 years ago, and you worked with uh, some animals yeah, in captivity? Uh, 1967. Behavioral research with an orca uh, named Skana at the Vancouver Aquarium, and they wanted uh, somebody to study the whale. What did you learn from her? Uh, mostly, I think I, I learned that this was a very unsuitable place to keep a remarkable being. That was around the time, actually, that uh, Dr. Michael Big, who died in 1990 and was very much uh, our mentor, and the true pioneer whose vision led to photo identification, he started learning about the societies that these whales live in around our coast, and that these were incredibly complex animals with very elaborate social relationships. You put the brain and the implications of that together with the social side, and you understand immediately that putting her in a concrete tank and uh, completely shutting off the company of her kind was an enormously unfair and inappropriate thing to be doing. But at the time, it was through the close contact of captivity that we begin to learn about them, one at a time. The story of one whale in particular, named Keiko, stirred our passion and raised enduring questions about captivity. Keiko was captured in 1979 in Iceland and became one of the 136 orcas taken into captivity since 1961. But he did not become one of the more than 100 that have died there or one of the 42 killer whales that remain in captivity. Captured at age two, and eventually sent to Mexico City, Keiko was breathing the world's smoggiest air, a master of the ocean at 7,000 feet above sea level, in the artificial seawater of a shallow pool, where he entertained the crowds. Keiko would have lived his life in poor health, swimming in circles except for one thing, he became a movie star. As Willie, he was free to 10 million film-going children. But in reality, Keiko went nowhere. The stress of his environment caused a skin disease, which spread as his health seriously deteriorated. The real whale was slowly dying, and Keiko had to be moved. When it was learned that Keiko was still captive, Millions of children wrote in, demanding his freedom, and a spontaneous movement was started to free the sick whale. Keiko's owners donated him for the unprecedented experiment of reintroducing him into the wild. And the Oregon Coast Aquarium customized a pool for his care. Suddenly, the reality of freeing Keiko became far more interesting than the movie, as Keiko began a long and complicated journey toward freedom. Ultimately, true freedom for Keiko would mean being accepted into a pod of wild whales, since orcas live their entire lives in tightly connected social groups where all members are related to each other. It's now understood the best chance for Keiko would be to find his mother. It very much is a matriarchal society or matrilineal in that everybody in the group is related through female descent to a, a female ancestor. Individuals stay with their mother or their grandmother for the whole life. And it took some years to really understand that because it is very unusual in that the large adult males never leave the group. The bond between a mature male and, and his mother is very, very strong. I know that Eve, the whale that came to you in the fog, was a matriarch. What happened when she passed away? Eve only had two sons, no, no daughters. And those two males went around Hanson Island for weeks and didn't survive her death for very long. Generally, the males will join their sister's family, but they, they become a loose satellite. They never again have the bond that they had with their mother. It's a unique social system. Orca is a very conservative animal. Basically, you only uh, socialize with somebody who your mother introduced you to. The resident populations on this coast are really very clearly divided socially into two different groups. The northern residents, it's about 240 whales, 16 pods. The southern residents are around 90 whales, three pods, quite a bit smaller. What's really interesting, and we don't really understand this, but they never mix. And then we have overlaying that, we have transients, the mammal hunters. They don't mix with the residents, but they will often mix with other transients. And then occasionally we have these offshore whales. And they don't mix with these others either. So we have these whales that in, in many ways are 
just focused on their very familiar neighboring groups that are of the same lifestyle. It's a pattern strangely familiar, much like human tribes, existing near each other, but separate, with languages and behaviors learned and passed on over generations. We define it as culture, and for both humans and orcas, different cultures exist among the same species. Did you get that, Carrie? Yeah, I think so. That was amazing. Okay. Hussey, I told you that oh, was boys, huh? And, I and they both did that. They both did... Oh, my God! <laughs> oh. The New Zealand orca I found are just so completely different from the Pacific Northwest. I had this paradigm that that was how orca were around the world. They, they had a matrilineal society and stayed in very um, strongly bonded groups and that there was another population who fed on marine mammals. Well, it turns out here that the New Zealand orca are moving around between groups. They feed on fish, sharks, rays and marine mammals. Acoustically, they're different. They have a good kiwi twang, just like I do. <laughs> And it looks like they're moving big distances compared to the animals up there. I've got them traveling an average of 100 to 150 kilometers a day. And I think that's one of the things that fascinates me about orca is the different cultures. Even though they're in similar habitats, they're just so completely different. Orcas have been stable in the social groups that we're looking at now for literally thousands of years. If you look at the society and understand that this has evolved over a very long period of time, you realize that you're looking at a, at a successful society. The wild pot. The challenge for him would be enormous since strong social bonds may actually define what it means to be an orca. At the time, no one knew how to free a captive orca. It was a new frontier to trainers like Steve Clausen and to Jean-Michel who became involved in the effort and who saw Keiko as a symbol of more than just one whale. Curator Nolan Harvey knew how far Keiko was from a wild orca. We're trying to teach Keiko to not only work for us within this pool so we can take better care of him, but we need to let him become a killer whale again. We need to untrain him. Our goal all along has been to give him control of his life. We're an active part of it, especially since he is here by himself. But the idea is to let him start making those decisions on what he wants to do, when he wants to do it. But previously, anytime he did anything, it was because somebody asked for it. Even with vastly improved conditions, Keiko continued to demonstrate his frustration from living in an artificial environment. He expressed his stress in Mexico by gnawing the concrete pool, damaging his teeth, and it continued in Oregon on his favorite rock. A decision was made to cover it in order to discourage the behavior and to protect the teeth of the ocean's greatest predator. An orca's sharp, conical-shaped teeth make feeding on large prey possible, but Keiko primarily eats fish, which orcas swallow whole, so his damaged teeth should not be a problem in the wild. When he arrived in Oregon, Keiko was a thousand pounds underweight, but soon doubled what he was eating in Mexico. His waistline increased by three feet. He gained nearly 2,000 pounds and grew eight inches longer. But he still had to be taught to catch live fish as a milestone for his release, and in order to survive in the wild. Accustomed to only dead fish, at first he treated the live meal like a toy. Surrounded by walls, Keiko had never been observed using echolocation in captivity. And to a wild killer whale, it's a fundamental skill. The whale's hearing spectrum is many times ours. Their sensitivity is incredible. They see with sound, so when they're finding food, they use their echolocation. They make sounds, they get echoes, and they can turn that into a mental three-dimensional image somehow. You know, when you go into different places around the world and you, you look, at, uh, look at what orcas are doing and understand that they've sort of figured out how to live in the particular niche that they happen to have found, it's really interesting looking at the differences. As gray whales migrate up the coast through Monterey, California, 
A pod of transient orcas show why they're called wolves of the sea. They hunt in packs to isolate, then overpower a gray whale calf. It's a predictable hunt, with as many as a third of the calves taken by orcas. 20 to 30 whales may work together and share the bounty. Sharing seems to be really important in these groups. It seems to be part of the way that the whales live together to avoid competition. Certainly they food share when it comes to feeding on, on larger animals, but that's probably more a facet of the fact that these things that they're feeding on like whales are so big and there's not many of them in terms of they kill one, then everybody has to feed on it. A female, the best hunters, will bring up a fish and others from her matriline will come over and share that prey item. What's kind of surprising for the residents, they will share even a salmon that's perhaps only uh, five, ten pounds. They will share that even though any whale in the group could easily swallow. It has given us a new appreciation and, and insight into the workings of their society. That said, even though their dietary preference is culturally maintained and driven, they don't seem to be really adaptable in the short term. It might take a while before they can start focusing on alternative species. Killer whales are real traditionalists. They only do what mom did. They eat when mom eats and they socialize with the whales that mom socialized with. They really don't like to branch out. So if you have a habitat change and that particular prey is not there anymore, then it's difficult for the orca to adapt. Within decades, and for a variety of reasons. Orcas throughout the world may be at the crossroads of adaptation or extinction as their prey diminishes, something the resident whales of the Pacific Northwest now face. It's a growing issue for the future, but is similar to the question of whether Keiko would be able to adapt to hunting live fish in the wild. Without another whale to teach him, Keiko initially seemed confused about the shift in his diet until finally either hunger or common sense kicked in and he began to catch a few live fish. In the wild, that wouldn't be enough. Using ultrasound to measure Keiko's fat layer or blubber, the staff identified where it would show if he weren't eating enough. In theory, by measuring his blubber so easily in the wild from an extended pole, scientists could know if and when they would have to intervene. They did know that Keiko would have to be in better shape than he had ever been. So even his 30 different toys were designed with a purpose. Filled with water, a 200 pound ball became Keiko's workout. When he first arrived, Keiko could barely hold his breath for three and a half minutes. He soon progressed to almost 18, normal for a wild killer whale. But Keiko was still far from a wild whale which was vividly seen when at night he gathered his toys around him to sleep. An array of cameras and hydrophones captured Keiko's movements and sounds. Taking advantage of this opportunity, scientists carefully analyzed his vocalizations, trying to match them with specific behaviors, hoping to take a step toward understanding killer whale communication. Keiko, however, had not communicated with another orca in more than 20 years. I was studying a pair of whales called Orky and Corky. They would begin conversations with certain sounds and end conversations with certain sounds. And I realized that studying communication between those two whales in captivity would be like studying communication between two people in a prison. That there was no way that I was going to actually learn what they were saying and the real context of their lives. I'll tell you the, the main thing about Corky, and, and she's a survivor. She has been in captivity for 38 years, about 43 years old, which is incredibly old for a captive orca. Most of them die within 10 years. She still uses the calls of the A5 pod, and uh, she is swimming in run run the tank, and in a concrete tank, it, the sounds that they make reverberate off the walls of, of, of the tank. They're, they're constantly in an, in an acoustic fuzz. I think it's an incredibly stressful environment simply because of that. And how is your research here at Orca Lab different? Well, when I was um, working in, in 
captivity and understood that if one wanted really to learn about them you needed to go into the wild and study them there at a distance and that's where we uh, got into developing uh, remote hydrophone systems that enable us to hear whales that we can't see. We have a network of hydrophones, covers about 50 square kilometers of the area around us and we have speakers all over the place, we're listening to all of them all of the time, 24, 7, 365. <laughs> <laughs> but we're normally listening to a space and there are many voices in that space. In a sort of general sense, we understand when the whales are doing certain things. We understand when they're chasing fish, for example, because we're hearing echolocation. We understand when they're resting, because they make these really sort of low-energy calls. But we don't know who the voices belong to. So I, I think a really fascinating area to get into is the question of who as, a, as individuals are we listening to. And if we can understand who's speaking, maybe ultimately we might begin to understand what is being said. I wanted to take all that I learned in captivity and apply it to wild whales. And so I contacted a brilliant scientist in Canada, Dr. Mike Big. And I asked him, do you know what family of whales Orkin Corky came from? Which sounds like an extraordinary request, but he at the time was photographing each dorsal fin and saddle, learning to tell them apart, collecting all the pictures from the capture. And there was a bunch of pictures that showed this whale we now call A23 with little baby Corky just before she was taken from her mom. So I had no boat experience. I threw everything into a pickup truck and we pumped up the Zodiac in Alert Bay and we went out there and I stopped and I put the hydrophones down, put on the headsets, and it was her family calling. And for the first time, I heard these sounds in their natural environment just rolling on and rolling on and echoing. And my first feeling was enormous guilt that it was me that was there, not Corky. But um, that's how I found them. One promising factor in Keiko's finding his family was that orca calls can be heard 10 miles away. There was hope for a dialect match among the North Atlantic orcas, where Keiko would be reintroduced, 100 miles from where he was captured. To prepare for his move, a bay pen was constructed in a pristine Icelandic bay. Finally, the day arrived to return Keiko to the home he barely knew. This had been Keiko's unexpected journey to freedom that millions of children demanded, but that no one knew exactly how to accomplish. Jean-Michel had watched Keiko's transformation for over two and a half years and had been witness to his devoted fans. Good luck. Even the U.S. Air Force had agreed to rent a C-17 cargo plane and crew for the trip, announcing it was in the best interest of the nation to fly Keiko home. He was covered in ointment for the flight to protect his skin from drying. After 15 anxious hours out of his element, Keiko was at last returned to the cold ocean waters of his birth. It was seen as the first step to restoring what had been taken away when he was captured. Keiko would first have to acclimate inside the confines of the bay pen. Months later, his world expanded to the enclosed bay, where for the first time, he ruled in relative freedom. It was Keiko's first chance at a small piece of the wild. Not since he was two years old had he experienced the sights, and especially the complexity of sounds, of a natural ocean environment. It had been 23 years, half his expected lifetime, since Keiko had even seen the bottom of the sea.
Keiko's world was gradually expanding, and for the next step, a satellite tag was attached to his rare flop dorsal fin in order to follow him at sea. Its attachment was no more painful than piercing an ear, but the tag and Keiko would have to wait another season following complications to be tested at sea. Finally, in the summer of 2000, sea trials began. Everything from then on was up to Keiko. The difficult promise to give him the choice of freedom had been kept. Then at last, Keiko was within feet of wild killer whales. He seemed enthusiastic at first, but then experienced what might have been shyness or fear and turned back. Later encounters looked aggressive, and Keiko continued to seek the shelter of the boat. Right there, Captain. Right there. Right there. Of course, it's speed model. Over three summers, Keiko continued to approach passing whales, spending more time with them, possibly learning their ways. Then, in 2002, after watching a pod feed on herring, he simply swam away in the proximity of whales. For over two months, Keiko was tracked by satellite. His course revealed no details about his experiences in the wild, but he emerged a thousand miles away, sufficiently fed and unscathed. An enormous success. Then, perhaps seeking human companionship or just chasing an easy meal, Keiko followed a fishing boat into a Norwegian fjord. Keiko was still alone, but he was welcomed by enchanted children who must have felt they already knew him. Strong bonds are undeniably formed between captive orcas like Keiko and people. But we've been slow to consider that the ocean's greatest predator, wild and free, may also be curious to understand us. Hey, I see you there. Come on. Do both of these whales take interest in your boat? Well, you know, as a scientist, you have to say no. Uh, but as a whale hugger, oh, for sure. You know, there's no doubt in my mind. In an effort to both protect orcas and to involve the public, Orca Hotline, Ingrid speaking. Ingrid founded the Orca Project Hotline. Oh, that's fantastic news. And so what direction were they going when you saw them? Her nationally advertised number rings with reports of orca sightings and strandings, like that of the whale she named Ben. Oh, Ben. He stranded in 1997. And I knew him before the stranding. But when you're involved with an animal at that sort of level, there's just something about it, you know, and they look you in the eye and they're at your mercy to rescue them. And with Ben, we had an overnight ordeal. And then we rescued him, and the next day he was back with another group of orca, which was just incredible. But a year later, uh, he got run over by a boat, and it was just tragic. But a year later, I found him. And his dorsal fin, the back half, had completely collapsed and folded over. So now he's got this funny little fin where bit sticks up and the, the rest folds down. But he survived and he's very cautious of boats now. But he'll still come over to my boat. I think that 
by showing people the variation within the individuals, it makes the animals a little bit more personable, if you like. If somebody can call me up and say, hey, I just saw Ben, it gives them a little bit of a stake in Ben's life. And so hopefully, you know, they'll slow down their boats, they'll drive a little more respectfully. Uh, the data, of course, is really valuable for my research, but ultimately I want it to be that the public will want to protect these animals. Keiko, however, was at risk of being loved too much by a well-meaning public. The Norwegian government passed laws to protect him, and the Free Willy Keiko Foundation and the Humane Society of the U.S. agreed to continue his care. He arrived in Norway, obviously having fed himself at sea, but without fish in the fjord, concern grew, and the decision was made to begin feeding him again. Keiko had everything he needed, except the company of his own kind. In 2003, after more than a year in Norway, at age 26, relatively young for a male orca, Keiko took a final breath and died from a pneumonia-like virus. His burial was the last outpouring of affection for the whale we thought we knew and who had done everything we asked. Keiko was the whale we had forever changed. And no matter how good our intentions, he was the whale we couldn't fix for him to become what nature had intended, an orca in the close company of other whales. It wasn't possible, even for the world's most loved, most famous whale. I think it would be quite impossible for anybody to propose capturing an orca, at least in North American waters at this point. So I think uh, in that sense we've come quite a long way in terms of public attitudes. In terms of what we understand about orcas, uh, we've also come a long way. I think at this point we understand enough about uh, orca society to realize that this is complex and remarkable and fascinating. And uh, we, we don't have the whole story yet, but what we do understand is really, really interesting. The debate about returning captive orcas to the wild and keeping them in captivity continues passionately, especially as we learn more about them, and continue to discover that there may be few other species more like ourselves. There do still remain countries tolerant of capturing orcas, but in most of the world, any up-close, hands-on contact comes when a whale ends up on the beach, stranded. Ingrid Visser is again changing what we know. You know, there was a lot of controversy, and there still is, about saving stranded whales and dolphins. People say that they have crushed internal organs from, from sitting on the beach for so long. And then other people say that uh, they're no longer viable. The stress hormones and all of this sort of thing that these animals can't reproduce and that they're basically a drain on society if you put them back because they're going to be eating fish and contributing nothing so miracle um she stranded she was rescued and then i saw her again after the rescue three years later and then about five years later she had her first car and that car is called magic so it was really, really incredible to see Miracle, who had the stranding event, being rescued and then had her very first calf and the calf has survived. So yeah, magic it was. Come on! <laughs> How cool was <is> that? <laughs> wow. <laughs> In the middle of her research, Ingrid gets a call that a small female orca is stranded on an isolated beach in heavy surf. She and the team rush to assist. She's somewhere on this bit of coastline here. We're not sure exactly where, but this area here, these lines on the chart are marking that it's really rough and surf breaking. So we're kind of hoping we'll be able to pick her up and move her by tractor and trailer somewhere into here. Okay, well, let's do it. Go. Time is critical in a stranding rescue. So Ingrid and Jean-Michel will fly directly while the team drives the five hours to the site. New Zealand's hills are bordered by a twisting 9,300 mile coastline. Whale strandings are fairly common, 
but successful rescues are not. The orca was first sighted around 1 o'clock by some hikers in a very remote part of the west coast, west of Auckland, tossing and turning in the surf. We uh, ultimately got to the beach and indeed this uh, young female, a little over three meters long, was uh, very badly stranded. So when we actually first saw her, of course there's just the natural emotions of just wanting to break down and cry and, and knowing that she's away from her family and knowing that she has no idea of where people that are going to help her or hurt her. But help comes by digging holes for her flukes and flippers to relieve the discomfort, then keeping her skin moist. She was probably not alone, struggling in the surf, and another whale may have tried to pull her back to sea, judging from the marks raked across her tailstock. Ingrid names her Reiki. Most important to her survival is keeping the young whale hydrated after hours of stress on the beach. Ingrid is successful in getting her to accept a tube bringing water. Yeah. It's a triage that also involves reassurance and comfort. Even with expert care under changing conditions, it's believed that an orca can survive only about 24 hours out of water. Hopefully, she'll be okay. And hopefully, we're united with our pod. She's a young female, needs her family. We're very, very anxious to see her back in the ocean, in her world. We move the animal just um, just right up above this uh, tiny little town where there is a facility where we could pull the truck and the trailer right next to a freshwater source. So we had a hose where we could water her down and we had an ongoing watch throughout the night. But finally by 4 a.m. we knew it was time for Ingrid and, and Carl and the team to discuss what the options were to get her back into the water. Me was her family. Carl and I have done orca streamings before where two hours after we released the orca um, it met up with its family. So the, okay. it can be a long way away and the animals will return if they hear her, but they won't be able to hear her calling if she's inside here over the bar with the surf. But okay. then if we take her to the other coast, it's 100% guaranteed she won't find her family immediately. Yeah. That's the worst con. Mm. Um, for both scenarios is that where is her family? I defer to you more for not biological yeah. in terms of your knowledge of the animals. Um, in terms of running operation, yeah. staying here and releasing here is, as you can appreciate, by far it's the much, most appropriate thing yeah, to do. Yeah, it is definitely, but for her, Once I think it's better to have her on the other, other coast. We have and she knows very well that pods here off the North Island will visit the west and east coast frequently. So she felt confident putting this animal in the east side of the country that there is a very good chance that this young whale will hook up with her family in the near future. A decision is made to move Reiki to the East Coast and the team prepares for what must be done to save the whale. For the heart monitor we put it on early in the morning and Ingrid wanted to keep track of her heartbeat throughout the rest of her time on the flatbed. It's becoming clear to the team that a positive outcome for the rescue is not guaranteed. For me personally, it was the first time I've seen a orca so close. But Ingrid, with her trust in us, we really were not only filming and assisting, but we were participants. And when she had asked me to sit next to the whale and help keep the heart monitor on her the entire time, it was my job then to really have that continuous touch with the animal and, and really hopefully transmit my calmness to this animal. And her heart was very uh, normal, was average between 60 and 80 heartbeats per minute. And there were times when it even dipped a little bit, which was hopefully a sign of her calmness. And so an unusual procession moves through New Zealand's largest city. So we drove right through the heart of Auckland, 90 minutes through town, 
With a moment of uh, just sitting there thinking, I'm with a whale. I'm sitting here with a whale. We finally arrive over the east side and pull into the harbor and the, the ramp. We're about to put the animal in the water and there's well over 100 plus people cheering as we drive up. gently rocked into the water, but is disoriented from the ordeal and lies still. From there, there's a full flood of emotions. And at first, the animal is hardly moving at all. And Ingrid's like, it's all right. You know, her muscles, if you could just imagine your muscles just cramped for hours and hours and not being able to stretch. So she just is probably just, you know, stretching out and getting back into this fluid environment. And finally, Ingrid says, just to have some of the people back away and only two of you stay close to her to support her. So sure enough, as soon as three people backed away from the animal, Carl and one of his staff are right by the head. She just gives a big kick of her tail and you just see the movement and her dorsal fin just slice through the water as she slowly travels out in the deeper water. We've heard the stories of dolphins pushing people in need back to shore. And now this team has carried a young whale back to the sea with a chance at life. Perhaps orcas and people share an additional trait, the ability to care for another species, including each other. In our complicated relationship with nature, it may be a bond unlike any other. I think I've only just begun to scratch the surface with these guys. Pretty much every time I go out, I see something new or interesting, and I just wish I knew so much more about them. Just the, the real basics, like where do they go when I don't know where they are? What are they saying to each other? How do they teach the young ones how to catch things? And what happens to them when they're naughty? And just, yeah, fun stuff like that as well. And then on the science side of things, how are they impacted by pollution in the marine environment? What sort of things can we do to protect their habitat? If you teach people about these animals, they're going to understand them better. And if they understand them better, they're going to love them more. And if they love them more, then, yeah, they're going to look after them, I hope. For a long time, it stumped me. People go, why do we need the whales? Why do we need the whales? And, you know, in truth, why do I need my earlobe? You know, why do I need any specific part of my body? Because it's part of the whole. And you can live without parts, but it's a degraded existence because it, it's all knitted together. 